Thanks to Nebula for sponsoring this video. This video is an introduction to something you've almost certainly heard of but might not know very much about. So what is El Nino? El Nino refers to this current of warm water that appears off the west coast of South America from time to time. But confusingly, when people talk about El Nino, they could be referring to this current, or more likely, one of two connected things. The first is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is one of the most incredible things on Earth, and this current is just part of. ENSO, for short, is a system of coupled changes in the Pacific Ocean and the atmosphere over it. Changes in how the winds blow over the Pacific Ocean leads to changes in how water moves around in the ocean, which changes the temperature of the ocean, which then changes how winds flow over the Pacific. We tend to describe that coupled system as being in one of three states, that it flips between basically randomly every couple of years. The neutral state is the long-term average, where things are doing what they normally do. The trade winds blow from east to west across the Pacific, rising up in the west and forming a closed loop. Underneath that loop, ocean water is also transported east to west, which gets heated by the equatorial sun, and the result is a west Pacific that's warmer and wetter than the East Pacific. The second state is called the La Nina state. In La Nina years, stronger trade winds blow. This causes more warm water to move westward, and the West Pacific is warmer than usual. Over in the east, cold water from the deep ocean wells up to replace the water that travelled to the west. So the West Ocean is warmer than usual, and the East Ocean is colder than usual, causing the stronger trade winds. Basically, a more intense version of neutral conditions. The third state, though, is the El Nino state. And when people talk about El Nino, this is what they're normally referring to. During an El Nino event, everything gets disturbed and the Eastern Pacific can warm up. And because of that, the trade winds, which are kind of maintaining this east-west gradient, are weakened. The rainfall can move over the central and even into the East Pacific. And this messes with the circulation in the atmosphere and in the ocean, and this causes a massive reorganisation of the global climate system. The El Nino state is a very different beast. Not just the opposite of La Nina, but it can also be much more intense. The waters of the eastern Pacific can be several degrees warmer, and rainfall patterns shift massively to the east. This can be an enormous change for basically the entire ocean basin. So just to recap, El Nino refers to this current of warm water that appears in the El Nino Southern Oscillation climate system when it is in the El Nino phase. I know, it's a bit confusing. Just remember that El Nino means warm Pacific Ocean. So why does ENSO flip between those states? It's important to understand that it's not as simple as the atmosphere forces the ocean, or the ocean forces the atmosphere. We cannot say whether a change in one of those two parts of the system will cause the whole system to flip state. The atmosphere and the ocean are tightly coupled, and we don't exactly know why they flip between those two states. Some people will say that the system is just inherently unstable, like it's an unstable oscillator that bounces between El Nino and La Nina, with some returning force that restores it to a neutral state. Other theory is that it's the system is relatively neutral, but it's being kicked around all the time with noise, so it's kind of like a stochastic oscillator. And I still don't know I still don't know if we understand which one it is. These numbers on the screen, by the way, are references. They're linked down in the description if you would like to read further on this topic or other topics in this video. So why is El Nino important? There are two big reasons why El Nino is so important. Firstly, the Pacific Ocean is huge, and so natural changes in its average temperature will have a large impact on global average temperature. We'll come back to that. But secondly, and in my opinion much more interestingly, whether ENSO is in a La Nina or an El Nino phase has huge impacts literally around the world. As I mentioned previously, the rainfall is normally in the West Pacific. Associated with rainfall, you have a huge amount of heating of the atmosphere because of the, the latent heat diffusion of water, so that when the water condenses it, uh, in, the, in the clouds and fall, falls as rain, it releases a lot of heat, and that heating source in the atmosphere triggers waves. Waves here just means patterns of alternating areas of high and low pressure or temperature that then can move through the atmosphere. Wave is just what we call that in atmospheric science and they're kind of a big deal. And if you start shifting around where the rainfall is, then you're going to change where the source of these waves are, and you're going to change weather as far away as the South Pole, for example. We call this changing of the weather at a distance a teleconnection, and there are lots of them on Earth, but ENSO is the biggest and most important. 
If the Pacific is in an El Nino state or a La Nina state, that makes certain weather conditions more likely in other areas of the world. For example, in El Nino years, it's more likely that the Indian monsoon will be weaker and there'll be more wildfires in Indonesia. It also makes it more likely that the Amazon will be drier than usual. But no two El Ninos are the same, and there's no guarantee of its impact. So, for example, uh, you would expect to see dry northern Australia during an El Nino event. In the big 97-98 El Nino event, northern Australia was wet, and no one really understood <laughs> why that was the case. I previously did a whole video on how El Nino might have caused the downfall of entire civilizations in the past. Link up on the screen and down in the description. And of course I mention it in my book, Firmament. Ideal Christmas present. Is El Nino connected to climate change? Enso and the El Nino state within it are entirely natural phenomena. They would occur whether humans were here or not. But El Nino is still a really important topic within climate science. Firstly, as I already mentioned, the state of Enso has a huge impact on natural global temperature changes. There are lots of reasons why the average temperature of the planet might change entirely naturally, including Enso, but also other things like the Madden Julian oscillation in the Indian Ocean, but also random one off events like volcanoes erupting, spewing sulfates into the air, reflect sunlight away, temporarily cooling the earth. Total natural temperature changes over the past century look like this, and human influenced temperature changes from burning fossil fuels and other activities look like this. When we combine them, we get the observed change in global temperature. And while the human influence dominates over the whole century, natural changes are really important year to year, and explain why we don't break the record for global temperature every year. For example, 2016 was for a long time the warmest year on record because of a huge warm temperature anomaly that year from, you guessed it, the Pacific being in an El Nino phase. This year we expect to be the new warmest year on record, with the temperature anomaly up to December being somewhere between 1.4 and 1.5 degrees Celsius, and that is because of human influence. But a large part of the increase from last year is because the Pacific went from being in a long La Nina phase into an El Nino phase. And so when we leave this El Nino phase, global average temperatures will fall slightly. But just to be very clear, just because this curve goes down, this curve still a really big problem. But an interesting question is, is Enso and El Nino changing because of climate change? And Matt was one of the lead authors on a huge paper that came out on this subject two years ago in the journal Nature. Up until recently, it was difficult to answer this question because scientists were looking at how the sea surface temperature part of El Nino was changing in different predictions of the future by different climate models. But remember, Enso also has that rainfall component. If you look at the, the rainfall changes, um, they seem pretty robust across models. So all the models were telling us the same thing. In, in the future, the rainfall is shifting further eastwards more often. So if you measure, start measuring ENSO in terms of the shift in the rainfall pattern, you get this more consistent picture of increases in the extreme events and more frequent uh, El Ninos. Actually, that, that metric is actually more important in terms of the teleconnections because you know, the, as we spoke about previously, the atmospheric heating is associated where the convection sits. So on a warmer planet, we expect ENSO to flip between La Nina and El Nino states more frequently, and that will result in greater variability of weather all over the planet. There's also the possibility that there may be an increase in the frequency of El Nino years specifically, according to some of the models. You'd think that you could compare those model predictions with what we've observed over the past couple of decades to see if the models are right, but Honestly, we don't have enough data. The system only flips every couple of years, and we need longer to see if there's been any change in the long-term statistics. One way or another, we're all gonna find out whether the models are right together. So El Nino is a current of warm water in the Eastern Pacific Ocean, but much more than that. Whether the Pacific Ocean Atmosphere System is in an El Nino or La Nina phase has huge impacts on the rest of the world's temperature, rainfall, and much more. It directly impacts the average temperature of the Earth, on top of the anthropogenic warming signal. Like so many parts of our planet, it is beautiful. It's this duet between the atmosphere and the ocean. But also, like many beautiful parts of our planet, our influence as humans is growing, and we still have much to understand about it. But hopefully now you know at least the basics.
Now, let me tell you a quick story. At the end of my PhD, before I started making videos full time, I went to VidCon Amsterdam. And I met a bunch of incredible people, including some amazing educational creators like Real Engineering, Wendover Productions, and Real Life Law. And later that year, just after submitting my thesis, actually, I found myself in New York, and I was asked if I'd like to join that group of creators in building something. At first, we just worked together in securing sponsors for our videos, an agency. But we wanted to build something more. We wanted to build something where we could post our videos and not have to worry about sponsors or advertising in general. And Netflix for educational video, but owned by us, the creators. That something became Nebula. And over the years, we've gone from success to success. We've produced original series like Becoming Human, Taboo on Screen, and Extremities. We've produced original films like Patrick Willem's Night of the Coconut and Abby Thorne's The Prince. This year, we hit two thirds of a million active users. And it's not an exaggeration to say that Nebula is changing the way that online video is financed, away from advertisers and towards audiences, putting control back in the hands of creators. More than half a million people currently enjoy the benefits of Nebula, watching videos before they are published on YouTube, able to download videos to their devices, and with access to exclusive content. I've made several original videos and companion videos to projects on YouTube, and you can watch them all on my Nebula page. I've also made an entire class on how to tell stories about science on Nebula. Meeting those creators in Amsterdam changed my life. And Nebula has changed my life. It's changed the way that finance works for us creators. And I think going forwards, it's going to have a bigger and bigger influence on the wider internet. To be part of that and get access to everything Nebula has to offer, you can sign up at go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark, link in the description, for just $2.50 a month. Or, at the moment, we have a limited time offer. You can get for yourself or as a gift for a friend, lifetime membership. We're offering this to raise money for huge projects that we're filming next year. I'm just not allowed to say what they are just yet. But I can say that it's taking Nebula to the next stage of financing creator projects. As previously, we didn't want to be beholden to outside investors. We wanted to be beholden to our audience. And so we're offering you lifetime membership. And you, in exchange, never have to worry about managing your subscription ever again. Lifetime membership is a one-off payment of $300, and will give you access to Nebula for as long as both you and we are around. That link again was go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark. With thanks to Nebula for sponsoring this video and for changing my life. Thanks to Professor Matt Collins for chatting with me, and also thanks to Matt Lazo for their help in compiling the extensive literature on this subject. Thanks must also go to my patrons. Patrons get early access to videos, they can vote on a video topic a month, and they get exclusive access to a behind-the-scenes monthly vlog. Executive producer patrons are the people that you are seeing on the screen right now, and if you'd like to join them, please do head to patreon.com forward slash simonoxfizz, linked in the description. Let me know what you thought of this format. I'd like to do more videos like this on key features of the early Earth system. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. And if you like the video, please do also pop it a like. Here's some recommendations for your next video. And that just leaves me to say thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.